Is this on? Yeah, that's on. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So today we're going to be talking about cherry bark oak or Quercus pagoda. This is a tree I didn't know existed until uh, early this year. And I realized I'd been probably misidentifying a lot of black oaks and then probably occasionally also mixing it up with southern red oak. And uh, some of you also, this might be uh, new information. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. <clears throat> So pagoda is the specific epithet and a pagoda, pagoda is a specific type of structure there in the middle um, that the leaf bears a interesting resemblance to. Yeah, so a very, very distinctive leaf. Just, just out of curiosity, who is aware of cherry bark oak? Who knows about it? Ben? Okay, so a lot of you. Awesome. Because of, because of your work order, yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> right on. <laughs> For the mic, that was because of Sam's work orders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so the original taxonomic classification for cherry bark oak was actually um, Quercus falcata var pagodifolia. So it was considered a variety of southern red oak, um, which is easy to understand. The trees are quite similar in a lot of ways, but dissimilar in some ways that will be very useful for identification. The main one, is if you look at these leaf bases, this is cherry bark oak on the left. We have this really nice kind of flat V. And then on the southern red oak, we have more of a U to this, uh, to that leaf base. So that is going to be a very useful, and for me, kind of the, one of the primary ways that I distinguish between uh, southern red oak and cherry bark oak. Uh, there are more differences. <clears throat> Uh, and then here's fresher versions. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's interesting to note about Southern Red Oak is you have three kind of distinct leaf types or leaf shapes. Uh, we call that polymorphism or heterophily. Um, this is a leaf shape that is really distinct, I found, to Southern Red Oak. This kind of, it looks to me like a dinosaur footprint. Um, <clears throat> so if you're seeing that on a tree, then it is not going to be a cherry bark oak. The, I'm sure the two hybridize, um, although they don't occur in the same types of habitat, and we'll get into that in a moment. So what about the name cherry bark? Here on the left, we have Prunus aretina, or our native black cherry, and then on the right, Quercus pagoda. You notice there's some really interesting uh, similarities there. Um, also, cherry bark oak is interesting in the, set, in the fact that um, the, the bark pattern is pretty consistent from the base of the tree all the way into the upper portion of the tree. For southern red oak, you're going to have a rougher lower. Um, the, the bark on the lower part of the tree is going to be rougher. And then it's going to start to exhibit some soft ski trails similar to northern red oak um, the higher you get in the canopy. And so, the ski trails is actually how I've heard botanists refer to this pattern. If you, um, I've mentioned this before, but if you're working on tree ID, there is not a better resource than NC Dendrology on YouTube. If you have any questions, um, or if you don't remember that, just shoot me a text. But I watch those videos like obsessively. They're really, really fantastic. So if I'm, especially for the hollies, which I've been working on for like months, <laughs> I still feel like uh, I have a hard time. Um, yeah, just go on YouTube, put in the name of the tree that you want to work on, and then add NC State Dendrology. There are videos that are geared towards like students in their horticulture classes. They're, they're really, really well done. <clears throat> so yeah, this is uh, northern red oak here, but cherry bark oak is not going to have these ski trails. So for the red oaks, um, this is a really useful characteristic to be aware of and to uh, help you distinguish between our southern oaks. So black oak is also a tricky um, oak tree to identify. Um, it's more similar in terms of its bark to cherry bark oak than some of the other oaks. The easiest way I've found is kind of a frustrating one because you have to hunt for like the acorns and then you have to assume the acorns you're finding are associated with the tree. Um, but if you look at the acorn cap um, on Quercus velutina or black oak, do you notice how these scales are actually um, not fully oppressed or it's, it's got more of kind of a scurfy, scruffy appearance. Whereas on um, Quercus pagoda or cherry bark oak, they're, they're pretty neatly um, flattened. So this is my primary way that I identify black oak in general. Um, there are a few other ways, but we may cover that in a future presentation. Um, 
the acorns for southern red oak and cherry bark oak are almost indistinguishable. Um, so the, the acorn really, the acorn cap works primarily, for me at least, to rule out black oak when I'm trying to get to an ID. <clears throat> Yeah, you have like the tufts of hairs in the the uh, leaf veins. Yeah, that's a that's another good distinction. Also, the shade leaves or the leaves like lower in the tree, they're going to have a blobbier appearance, almost no sinuses. It almost looks like if you're familiar blackjack oak. Um, and then the sinuses will get deeper and deeper the further up in the canopy you go. So, don't feel bad if you have a hard time identifying oak species. I've I've heard uh, um, oak specialists refer to oaks as very promiscuous within their groups. Uh, and within their group meaning, so the two primary groups, and there are a few others, but the two primary groups within the oak genus Quercus are white oaks and red oaks. Um, as a generalization, the white oaks are going to have rounded lobes and the red oaks are going to have a bristle tip. Now, you, sometimes you have to look really closely for that bristle, like with um, Quercus fellows or uh, willow oak but they're often there. I would imagine there are instances where it's not there. And there are some other differences between the two groups, but um, yeah, so cherry bark oak does hybridize with both black oak and, um, and willow oak, as well as others. Uh, this is a word we've covered that I misused last time, so I'm coming in for the redemption. Uh, oaks in general are monoecious which means of one house in Greek, meaning they have both male and female parts on the same plant. If we were botanists, we would call those staminate and pistillate flowers. And um, if you're looking to up your vocabulary, here's an easy mnemonic I've come up with. I'm very proud of this. Males may have stamina, but females hold the pistols. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> and the reason, so, and the flowers in general, they're catkins. So catkins are a flower type that can be found on um, other tree species as well, such as birch, these dangly things. And for oaks, the male uh, pollen-bearing flowers are uh, long and pendulous. And the female flowers are very, very short and uh, kind of hard to see. Um, and all, I, th I believe, I feel fairly confident in saying all trees with catkins are wind-pollinated. So... My other thing that I was really proud of this morning was that for oaks, sex is a breeze. <laughs> the other thing that I was really proud of that I uh, wanted to work in somehow was that like oaks on Tinder, they would be the ones that swipe right for everyone, you know, to see what flushes out instead of being selective. <laughs> uh, this is the range of cherry bark oak, so it's kind of fun. I, I always have... Uh, fond feelings for those trees that really prefer the southeast. Uh, I think of them as being more of, a, of an expression of our landscape here. And pretty, pretty clearly, you know, North Carolina there is a nice center of um, population density as well as, but yeah, clearly uh, more of a, a southeastern tree. And then again, in terms of habitat, it likes bottomland forests. So moist, well draining. That's another key differentiation. If you are trying to identify these in the wild, you are going to find um, Quercus falcata or uh, southern red oak in more drier upland sites. So here, the light green is the highest. Yeah. No. So the the green is just showing what state. So it, it's oh, showing that that occurs in that state, and then the light green is saying specifically where in the state that occurs. They, they just don't stop at the border there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Florida. I've noticed this with a few plants. There are a lot of things that really like the South but don't like Florida, and I kind of identify with that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so this is a tree that I looked at just a few days ago at one of our clients' houses. That is a 50-inch diameter uh, cherry bark oak. Um, one of the other interesting things to note about cherry bark oak that might be interested if they're in wanting to have their wood milled is it, it is one of the most valued of the southern oaks. It's got really, really good wood for like furniture, supposedly. Um, and so if we were looking to have to advise a client that was interested, um, this is a good tree to have milled if they wanted to, or just to retain some of the wood to give to a, a woodworking friend. Um, so we've covered the habitat, the differences between Quercus falcata and Quercus pagoda. Um, one of the other interesting things that would be good to keep in mind if you are recommending plantings to people, if they 
you know, someone's in their like 40s and they want a tree that's going to, you know, reach a respectable size like within their lifetime. Cherry bark oak, cherry bark oaks are one of the faster growing oak species along with willow oak, um, but seem to not have some of the issues um, that willow oak might have. So a good one to recommend if someone's looking for a large shade tree and they've got a lot of room um, for, a, for a big tree. Um, and they're also really hardy. So they occur in bottomland sites, but they're pretty well adapted to a wide range of soil types. So they'll do well on, on drier sites. Um, but the Quercus falcata is a little bit more drought resistant than that, Quercus pagoda. Had that tree been pruned or is that... These are actually pruning cuts that David made a few years ago. But you can see, um, so one of the things that they say about it versus uh, uh, Southern Red Oak is that it does tend to have better form. You'll notice this is a really great structure for a tree this size. Um, you know, all of those branches are pretty small in relation to the diameter of the trunk. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then it's often cultivated, meaning uh, people plant it. So you'll find it in places it likely wouldn't naturally occur. And I, I have seen, once I picked up that uh, cherry bark oaks exist, I started noticing them a lot. And again, I suspect that three quarters of what I was calling black oak were probably cherry bark oak. So similar to all of oaks, oaks are, you know, if you have a client that's interested in um, having, and, and more and more people are, if they're interested in what their landscape or what their yard is doing for local um, flora and fauna, oaks, as Catherine Bollinger discussed with us, support some over 500 unique species of Lepidopterans, the moths and butterflies. Uh, this is imperial moth, uh, the caterpillar of imperial moth. Uh, which I don't believe actually feeds on the leaves, but if you find that, I would love to love to see it, let me know. And then the a lot of different birds eat the acorns, so that's the white-breasted nuthatch, which is one of those. Woodpeckers also eat the acorns. An interesting thing to note um, about the difference between white oak and red oak is that for red oaks, acorns take two years to mature, and for white oaks, they will mature over a single year, and red oak acorns are also higher in tannins, so they're less valued Tannins are a defense compound that makes something bitter. So when you drink wine and you're obnoxiously discussing, you know, the, to, the flavor tobaccos or uh, polished leather, you're likely referring to the tannin concentrations, uh, which is a defense compound a tree might produce in order to discourage things like caterpillars from munching on their leaves. Um, and then from an arborist standpoint, as climbers, one of the things that you should be aware of that's true of cherry bark oak, but then true of red oaks in general, is you should be able to recognize hispidus canker, also called shaggy bracket. It produces these really dramatic elongate cankers on the stem with uh, thick wound wood along the margins. They can substantially reduce the load bearing capacity of a stem. If you see a tree with that um, it's, this is the most significant canker causing, canker causing fungal pathogen of oaks and red oaks in particular. If you come across this fruiting body, you can, you can kind of see this incipient wound wood along the margin there. The depressed area in between is the growing canker. Um, hispidus, the, uh, it's Inonotus hispidus. Um, the, the fruiting body itself is really spongy, um, as opposed to something like, um, um, like Fomes fomentarius or um, what's that called? The, the tinder, dried tinder conch or something. But a lot of, a lot of these kind of hoof-like conchs that grow on trees are gonna be like woody, they're gonna be perennial, you know, they're gonna persist on the tree for many seasons. Um, Hispidus canker, or his, the, the fruiting body of um, shaggy bracket is, is just an annual thing. And it, I've seen it anywhere from like July, I think June at the earliest, and then I've, I've seen it into August, so kind of in the middle of summer. But if you're, if you're seeing this type of pattern of damage on a tree and it's a red oak, you can be reasonably confident you're looking at a tree with a, a, a hispidus canker infection. And then you should treat it as a compromised stem. So. so was that taken at the pond down here, that one on the right? Um, the one on the right was taken at, I saw that at a, um, like a Buddhist temple facility. Okay. So, yeah. Do we know, like, is that found throughout the entire tree or is it a certain range of height? Yeah, so this, the, this photo, um, that was at a height of about 40 feet. Okay. And I've, I have seen them lower on the tree as well. Yeah, 
Uh, so just to answer your question, anywhere, yeah, anywhere along the stem. Um, once the, so the tree, the, or the pathogen decays both the heartwood and the sapwood. That's really, really critical to distinguish between heart rot fungi that are really restricted to the center of the tree. They're not going to be doing as much mechanical damage. They're not going to be, uh, you know, the strength of a tree, a lot of it really resides in, in the sapwood. And so the, the fungi that can go from the heartwood into the sapwood are always going to be the pathogens of greatest concern. Um, and this is one of those. And by the time that you're seeing these cankers, the fungus has been at work in the tree for quite a while. So it fruits and the cankers develop after a lot of damage has already been done. So um, obviously you would just refer to the track method. Uh, just because a tree has this, it doesn't mean it's a risk. There needs to be a target. So if there's no target, then uh, you'd want to just be mindful of it when climbing the tree and perhaps look for ways to mitigate the amount of um, forces that you were putting on the stem, like if you were rigging. But um, otherwise, yeah, the foundation, kind of the, the primary part of, or one of the primary considerations of the tree risk assessment method as outlined by the ISA is if there is no target, at least in terms of damage to other people or structures, then there's not gonna be much risk. Of course, there might be risk to the tree, but um, people are usually concerned about their stuff or themselves. Any questions? Um, so for those of you who have seen the, or, or have a good feel for identifying cherry bark oak, um, do you feel like you are able to identify well between red uh, cherry bark oak and black oak, say? Does anyone have any other observations about black oak? That's one in particular that I have to spend a lot of time looking at. Yeah, I don't feel like I can identify black oak, so I'm like... Yeah, and then uh, as well, again, if you're struggling to precisely ID a tree, you can always lean into the old, it's probably a hybrid. Ah, and the other interesting thing about... <laughs> <laughs> The other interesting thing about oak hybrids is that they are genetically viable. So, um, so for some hybrids, they'll, they'll hybridize and the resulting specimen will not be able to uh, pass on those like hybrid genetics. But for the oaks, the, that sort of mixed uh, genetic makeup can be, can be replicated. So um, yeah, nice. right. <laughs> Oh, oh, there's one more photo and he's not here. So I forgot. Um, this tree is the biggest, th that's something like 80 inches in diameter. Of course, that, that's like two stems. And so I was measuring um, or around the base of those two stems. But I noted that tree and it took me about a year to come back to it. But I climbed this with Vincent this summer. And Vincent's at about like 105 feet there. And he went like an additional 15 feet higher. Like I, I've never seen anyone tie into stuff as small as Vincent ties into. Um, and the tree can hit about 130 feet tall. So if you go to Congaree National Park, which they call the land of giants, there are something like a dozen national champion trees occur in, in Congaree. I don't think the national champion cherry bark oak is there, but there are some huge cherry bark oaks. So they get very, very big. Yeah, and this is, and so I have named this tree the Two Towers tree or the individual stems Orthanc and Minus Morgul for the Lord of the Rings nuts out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was your question? What's, uh, what species is next? Yeah. Oh, I think, so next I want to cover um, hypoxylon. I've learned some like really interesting things about hypoxylon canker, um, both in ways in which we are likely misidentifying it and then where uh, I believe it's also a more serious pathogen than what arborists have classically given it credit for. And that's based on readings I've done from um, the landscape disease book, that, that kind of Bible of um, tree disease. And then quite a bit of other sites also uh, refer to it um, yes, it's a secondary pathogen, meaning it's not going to be the primary stressor of a tree, but it absolutely does contribute to the death of a tree when it shows up. So that I think is going to be the next one is revisiting hypoxylon canker. So. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. <clears throat>